Well, look, welcome and good afternoon. Um, it's always good to do an afternoon session. I think we're still still awake, so that's great. And look, it's always great being at the Moodle Moot, you know, being able to share what the uh, the LMS teams have been up to. And uh, get the clicker working, there we go. Uh, and the AI, AI is the topic that I want to talk about today. Um, I'll try and stand still. I talk with my hands and I move around, which is like two bad things when I've got a podium mic, but we'll see how we go. So uh, as I said, so AI is what we're all here, what I'm here for today and what I want to talk about. And we've all likely seen there's a lot going on in uh, both the Moodle LMS e ecosystem and the broader community around using AI. And it's also really, really great to see uh, several presentations across the Moot over the next few days uh, with the various uses of AI and Moodle. So for my part today, I want to give a bit of an update of the work that the LMS team has been doing in the AI space. I'm going to start by giving an overview of our approach and the things that we've worked through so far and we're continuing to work through from sort of a design and development and delivery perspective. And then I'll also spend some time talking about the AI functionality that's in the most recently released uh, LMS 4.5. But when we start to talk about our approach of AI in the LMS, um, there's really sort of one very important thing that we need to reflect on, and it's the place where we need to start. And that's what is the problem we're trying to solve? Now, this is actually one of my favorite questions. If you know me for longer than probably about 15 minutes, you've heard me use this question. Yeah, people are laughing at me already. That's um, very transparent. Um, but look, from a product development perspective, is, if this isn't the, like your starting point, you're gonna find yourself on the wrong track really, really quickly. And there isn't much doubt that sort of the current generation of AI is going to impact a lot of things. We've seen some things of that earlier today and over the last couple of days. And it's going to make a lot of new things possible as well. But it is really worth remembering that AI is a tool. It's not an answer. It can facilitate solving a problem, but it's just not an answer into itself. So when we talk about adding to AI to a platform like LMS, we need to start thinking about what are the problems we're trying to solve. And for this, we've taken guidance from our roadmap vision. And I won't go into this in too much detail. Uh, we went through it a bit yesterday, and hopefully everybody remembers everything that we went through yesterday. But if you don't, I'll just really recap that it sort of has three areas. That's uh, unlocking creativity, facilitating collaboration, and optimizing outcomes. Um, and so when we look at the problems we want to leverage AI to help with, these areas are our guides. Uh, again, like yesterday, if you want more information on that, the QR code will take you to uh, the vision part of our website, so you can start to look at that in more detail. And the types of problems we want to solve with AI are just one aspect. Um, we really need to have a look at the sort of the landscape and an environment that we're operating in. And it's, there's a few parts of that landscape that I want to go through over the next few slides. Now, firstly, we know that humans are really bad at predicting the future, especially in the, uh, in the technology space. And one of my favorite examples of like how bad we are at predicting this future is this prediction from the 1900s World's Fair in Paris, where the prediction was by the year 2000, we won't have to teach anymore. We'll just be able to download informa information directly into students' brains. Now, obviously, we didn't get there. Um, looking at the faces of those students, we pro it's probably a good thing. They're just grinding that information into them. They're not really having the best time. So it's possibly good that we haven't gotten there yet. But this not being able to predict the future in sort of any great detail is a challenge when working with a new technology like AI. But even though we can't sort of predict it in that much detail, we do know that when a technology comes along, uh, we generally see this sort of following pattern where there's this initial explosion of variance of the technology that's then followed by this period of sort of consolidation and evolution. And then finally, we reach a standard. Uh, and this standardization can take quite a while. Um, for example, on the slide there, we've only really just gotten there with the charges for your mobile phones. And depending on how old you are, you've probably had a mobile phone for about 25 years now. Um, and in the case of AI services, we're still very much in that explosion phase and it's likely to continue for a while. So when we look at addressing this challenge from an LMS point of view, we need our approach to be flexible when adding AI to something like the LMS. Now, the rapid technological change is only really one aspect of the landscape we need to consider. Uh, market expectations are also something to need to be aware of, and this is not the first time today that you've seen a Gartner hype cycle, but you know they are that representation of expectations that most innovations are going to go through, and we have that sort of consistent pattern of sort of over-enthusiasm and then disillusionment and then sort of stability, and depending on what you think of AI is where we'll get to with that, uh, that stability. 
And, you know, I, I would definitely say in AI we're at, at least at that peak of expectation and over-enthusiasm, although we're definitely starting to see in uh, the tech funding and the AI investment space uh, that trough of disillusionment starting to happen. Uh, lots of VC funding, lots of tech funding, uh, basically just not seeing the return on their investment that they've you know, pumped into all of these AI startups. They're just sort of not getting what they're promised just yet. And that, that cycle of expectation in the market is something that we need to be aware of and position ourselves for as well. And sort of looking at sort of our audience as part of the landscape. Now, teachers and learners are definitely part of a large part of our audience that we need to consider, and that almost goes without saying, but I will say it. But we also need to consider people like our developers, and so those that extend the LMS platform via plugins or customizations, as well as those in the innovation and research space, so those who are using LMS and AI to push the boundaries or to do something novel. And we also need to consider those who are responsible for hosting and running LMSs, so those who you know are there to keep the lights on and make sure that they're up and performant. And all of these are part of our broader audience and their use cases are things that we need to consider and cater for when we think about adding AI to the LMS. And I suppose sort of moving on from the broader landscape and environment to things closer to the realm of Moodle LMS, there are sort of several things we need to consider here as well. Now, legislation is going to be a big part of this and several jurisdictions uh, already have legislation coming out around AI. A really good example of this is the EU AI Act. Um, if you want to sort of look into that, that's got some interesting ways of how AI will be classified based on what it does. But there's already existing uh, legislation we need to be aware of and around privacy and data control, for example, and GDPR is the big one that most of us will be familiar with. And you know that needs, that's a non-negotiable, that needs to be part of any solution. Uh, reporting needs to be central as well, and not just reporting from an auditing and compliance point of view, but there's you know could be great value in reporting for teachers, for example, and getting to ha understand and know how t their students are using AI in their course. Uh, access control is something we also need to consider, and this has a couple of parts. Um, Firstly, there's the need to be able to control what AI services are available to different user types and the context that they're available in in your LMS. And the good example of this is, you know, does your student, uh, does your organisation want your students to be able to access uh, generative AI while they're undertaking a quiz? Now, some organisations are going to want that. Some organisations are absolutely not going to want that, right? But we also need to be able to provide uh, contextual information to the AI system uh, that connects to the LMS to help feed its controls and its guardrails. Um, so, for example, if in the world, in the future, if you have an AI that's connected uh, to your LMS instance that's trained on all of the data in your LMS, do you want your students to be able to ask it what the questions or the answers on tomorrow's quiz are? Or perhaps maybe more concerningly, do you want one student to be able to ask for personal information about another student in your LMS? Uh, so we need to make sure that the, you know, the connected AI is aware of these sort of things so it can act accordingly. And that's always going to be an interesting dual responsibility model where we have responsibility on the LMS side and the AI will have to have responsibility as well. And that's going to be quite an evolving space, I think. Um, we also want to support the training of connected AI. So in that case where you do want to have a large language model or an AI uh, that's trained on the data in your LMS, we will need to be able to support and manage that, as well as things like uh, RAG, so retrieval, augmented generation, and other strategies where you're using information in your LMS to supplement responses from AI. We need to be able to support and cater for that as well. Uh, any solution needs to be able to be extendable. As I've already sort of mentioned, and as we've seen sort of over the last day or two, AI is exploding. You know, we need to be the solution to be able to flexible and manage for that. Um, and also, there are a lot of Moodles out there. Some of them are very, very big. And any solution that we put in the LMS needs to be able to scale, needs to be able to work with all of them. So how do we take all of these things into consideration and position ourselves from a product point of view? So from the LMS functionality side, we've introduced a, a new AI subsystem into LMS. So essentially, we've added core support for AI services to integrate into LMS and make that function availability available to your users. Now, as part of this work, we came up with the following mission statement of basically of what we also wanted to achieve, but to also help guide us. And this is sort of having something like this is very important, especially when we're dealing with technology like AI. So I'm just going to sort of walk through this. 
So our mission statement was a way to provide a consistent and user-friendly experience for users to interact with AI in Moodle LMS while allowing them to continue their teaching and learning activities. And this is very, that part's very important. We want AI to be assistive. We want AI to be helpful. We don't want AI to replace teaching or learning or to block teaching and learning. And we want it to be an, a helpful and assistive thing. We want to provide a straightforward integration with various AI providers on the back end. Again, the space is changing. We need to be able to adapt for that. And what we want to do with this all while adhering to our AI principles and the appropriate legislation. And you know, being legislative compliant is a non-negotiable, but as are things of being you know, open and transparent and you know, being clear in our intentions around AI. And if you haven't come across our AI principles before at Moodle, the QR code on the slide, sorry, lefty righty, um, will take you to our website that'll uh, give you some more information about that and I'll run you through them. So from an architectural point of view, the AI system design looks a little bit like this. I'm not gonna go through each of these components now. The sort of the point of this slide is really just to show that there are several components in a completely realized AI subsystem. And the image itself sort of hopefully speaks to a bit of size of the task. But what I will spend some time doing is going through the main concepts. So the AI subsystem consists of three main components that we're calling placements, actions, and providers. Now, placements are the UI elements and the associated workflows that allow users to interact with AI services to connect to LMS, and this is gonna really help enforce consistency. So, for example, it won't matter which AI service you're using to generate images, for example, users will always have a consistent interface and workflow. And, like, this is really important given the evolving space that AI is in. Like, things are changing daily, almost hourly, depending on the models that you're following, and your organizations are gonna wanna try different AI services and experiment, and every time you do make a change, you don't want that end experience changing for your users, or also too, for those who are involved, you don't want to have to update your documentation and your training guides, for example, every time you want to try a new model to generate an image. Uh, placements are also LMS plugins, they're a new plugin type in LMS, so that'll allow placements to be added uh, over the time, both by us at HQ and also definitely, hopefully, by you in the community. Now, pl placements will allow users to access what we're calling one or more AI actions. Now, these actions are provided by the services connected to LMS and other specific things a user can do with AI. Now, what actions are available will depend on what has obviously been configured in the LMS, but the context and that the user is in and their roles and capabilities. Again, that's that access control component, which is very important. So, for example, when, I, uh, when creating a course content, uh, a teacher could access an action to generate an image, or students could uh, use an action to summarize uh, complex text, and I'll, I'll show that in a bit. Uh, the available actions will be determined by which AI providers the LMS instance is uh, connected to, and uh, these providers are connected to uh, the LMS by what we're calling provider plugins. So that's another new plugin type that we've added as part of that. And it's the provider plugins that are the interface between LMS and the connected AI service. So for example, a plugin that connects the open AI API could provide an action that summarizes text, or a mid-journey provider plugin could provide an action to generate an image. And provider plugins will also be the way that you connect an AI service or a large language model that you've developed or that you've fine-tuned that's running in your own environment or on your own hosting. It'll, the provider plugin is the bridge that that will use to connect to your LMS. And this part of the design means you're just not locked into one AI model or AI AI provider. Again, you know, things are changing. We're giving you the flexibility to try out and, you know, experiment without need, the need to make fundamental changes to your LMS instance. So just as a really quick summary, placements are how users interact with AI. So they're your user experience elements, your user interface elements, and your workflows. Actions are the things that can be done, so such as generate an image, and providers provide the action uh, functionality, so things like connect to the OpenAI API, for example. Now, at this point, you're probably forming several questions, but I'm gonna have a guess at a few of them, and I think probably one of the first questions you're gonna have is, what is actually first? 
So in terms of the functionality that landed in 4.5, uh, which was released just over two weeks ago, it includes the base subsystem and all of the plugin types and everything that the system is built on. Uh, we're including uh, two providers. One allows you to connect to the OpenAI API or services that implement the OpenAI API, which there are a growing number of. Uh, the second uh, provider is allow you to use mo models from Microsoft Azure AI. We'll be supporting uh, three actions and two placements that provide the user-facing functionality. Now, placements uh, and actions probably brings us to the second question that you might have, is can we see it? So yeah, it'd probably be a bad career move at this point if I just moved on. So we'll, over the next couple of slides, I'll actually show you the functionality that we've released in uh, 4.5 in action. So the AI functionality we're going to look at first is focused on students and it allows them to summarize the text of their activities. Now, the teacher in this course has posted about a change of their contact hours in the course announcement forum. However, when doing that, they've just been so verbose. They've used about seven paragraphs of text for an announcement of about a change of contact hours and it's just too much for our student. It's just sort of too many words. So, a student is going to take a student's going to take advantage of the new AI summarize functionality, which they access by clicking the the summarize button on the uh, top left of the forum post. Now, because this is their first time that the, this student has used AI in their LMS, uh, they're going to be presented with the AI policy, and this policy explains to them about the limits of AI and how their data is used and things like that. Now, this only happens the first time that a user interacts with AI. And once they uh, accept this policy, uh, the AI function will go away and generate the uh, summarized text. And as you can see, or hopefully you can see it in the small screen, um, it's a much more concise summary of the announcement, but it still contains all the pertinent information. Um, and look, this is just was just one example of being able to summarize long or complex text and how it can help students. The ability to sort of summarize text is really good if you're you know, coming across a new topic area for the first time, being able to get a summary of it can give you the confidence to jump into it in more depth. If it's a topic area that you haven't visited for a while, being able to summary can sort of you know, give you that refreshment and jog the memory and you can go from there. Um, it is also worth mentioning that this is just being shown in a course announcement uh, context from a forum. It can be made available in any activity in your course. The next example we're going to look at is using the AI functionality to generate text. And this time the teacher in this course is reviewing their course material. And they're going to add an introduction for their module on cloud computing. Uh, you can see they've done most of the work, uh, but they have, a, they have to add the uh, introduction text. I've got a little to do here. So the new AI text uh, generation is accessed via the text editor. Again, as this is the, uh, the first time they're using AI in the LMS, they need to review and accept the AI usage policy. And once they've done this, they'll present it with the text generation interface. Uh, the teacher describes what they want the AI to generate, and then in this case, it's a short introduction for their service model topic. They then click generate, and the AI processes the request and will return a response. Uh, the teacher can, once it's generated, the teacher can then review the response and have the AI make changes or cha you know, uh, just regenerate it. But in this case, the teacher is going to be uh, happy with this. They'll give it a quick bit of a review and then, uh, then they'll move on. But they could, if they wanted to, change the prompt or just click regenerate and update what they wanted. Once the text is inserted into the editor, it can be updated like any other content. And again, our teacher is going to be happy with this and they're just going to save it and make it available. Now, I'm showing this uh, example as a teacher. Uh, however, it can be made available to anyone in your LMS. As I said, all of the AI functionality in Moodle is controlled by capabilities. So you and your organization can control where and who has access to the AI functionality. Uh, also, this example is just being... Uh, used in a, in a content module sort of context, but the functional, this functionality can be made available in any text editor in your LMS. The third example we're going to look at is using AI to generate images. Now again, uh, the teacher is still reviewing this course content. They've just added the introduction to their module, and now they want to add an image to go along with it. So they access the content they want to change uh, via the text editor and select where they want to insert their image. 
Uh, this time they've chose uh, the AI function. Sorry, <clears throat> this time they don't see the uh, the policy because they only they only need to accept it once. Instead, they're presented with the uh, image generation functionality, and the main thing that the teacher needs to do now is enter a description of what they want. Uh, they can also choose the image quality and aspect ratio, and then they'll click generate image, and the AI will go, AI will go off and generate it for them. Uh, just like the text generation, uh, they can review the image and have it regenerated if they want to. However, I'm reasonably confident the teacher's going to be happy with this image and they're going to choose to insert it once they've given it a quick review. Uh, once the image is generated, it's treated like any other image in the LMS. Uh, it just becomes like any other image. But because this image was generated from a description, the description is also used to generate the alt text for screen readers. And we're also adding a note to the alt text that this image was AI generated. Again, this is very important for transparency and making sure people understand when and where AI is being used in the system. Now, the teacher is happy with this image, so they insert it into the content. Again, because it's now just a regular image in the LMS, they can resize it and move it around to suit their needs. Um, the last thing that I will point out is actually on the bottom left of the slides here, uh, every image generated in LMS will uh, has a watermark added to it saying that it's AI generated. Again, that's reinforcing that transparency and it's very important. The cool thing is the actual text will um, change its background color and its coloring uh, based on the hue of the image so it's always readable and always sort of from a, a good usability and accessibility point of view. So this teacher in this course has now added both the introduction text and an image to go along with it in less time than it's taken me to explain it, which is actually pretty cool. Um, I just want to, I'm running out of time already, I know that, but I want to do want to wrap up by touching on the, uh, the admin settings for the AI system. And this is where you can control the settings for both the providers and the placements and set up the connection to your external AI services. It also lets you alter the system instructions that are sent as part of a request. So some of the AI actions like summarize text and generate text send across uh, or can send across system instructions to help tune the response and that depending on the model and depending on what your uh, organizational need, you can definitely adjust that. We've also built in uh, rate limiting functionality straight out of the box, so you can set that up and configure that if you want as well. Uh, really important for you know cost management and token, us token usage management and things like that. Now, that's probably two of a couple of questions I'm going to guess. Probably one of the third questions I'm getting is, yeah, that's really good, Matt, what's next? Um, so, as we sort of spoke about, about it, sort of Martin touched on it a bit this morning, we touched on it ourselves a bit yesterday afternoon, but you can expect to see sort of more placements uh, in the following versions of LMS. So, we're going to be building on this iteratively as we go. So, you know, more ways to use AI in your LMS. Uh, there'll be more providers, so even more options when it comes to integrating AI services, uh, and just generally more flexibility in how you configure and make the AI functionality available. We're also continuously uh, undertaking research and gathering feedback in this space, and that's sort of split in a couple of ways. So sort of tactically or in the short term, these are things uh, like making sure we're doing things the right way and what we're doing now. So, you know, one of the things we're looking at at the moment are better empowering teachers to control how AI avail is available in their course, and we want to do a little bit of research around that just to make sure we're getting the user needs right. Uh, more broadly and more strategically, we're going to look at deeper into what the next big things we can use uh, AI to help with, and Martin touched on some of those this morning. But sort of speaking of research, I'm going to give a plug to the Moodle Experience Lab. Um, I really do encourage you to sign this up, sign up for this via the QR code. Um, you will be able to participate in activities that are directly going to shape this functionality as well as uh, the other functionality in, in LMS. But I really did want to leave time for questions, so that's at sort of the end of the things I want to cover today. The QR code on this slide will take you to download the presentation so you can share it with your colleagues or review it yourself. But apart from that, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Have a good rest of the moot. Thank you, Matt. Great presentation. <laughs> Great job. Um, the prompt, well, when, you actually, when you're in the editor and you ask to, um, to add something with text or image, it, it's, it doesn't 
I have the ability to analyze the context. So per se, if I, was, if I were to say, make me an introduction to this particular subject, boom, it can't do that, right? You need the mic, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, that was my fault. Um, not yet, no. So the, it's, it's not contextually aware in that aspect yet, uh, but that's where you'll be seeing it going first. And a lot, just as a general comment on that sort of question, it's always an interesting balancing act in product development of getting things out that start delivering value and then holding off to add extra features. We really want to get this out, get the subsystem out that it's done, start showing people what can be done, getting the feedback and, and, and building on it. So we are, we're fully aware that it's not complete yet, but it's delivering value. We'll hopefully delivering value now and we'll build on it from there. Hey, hey Matt, um, this side, on uh, your left. <laughs> Ah, um, my, so, other, my other left, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, quick question. Uh, so using OpenAI as a provider could rapidly increase the cost, especially in big systems with many users. So my question is, are you considering you, um, another provider, maybe with more affordable prices? So yes, is the, the short answer with that. So even with OpenAI, um, the like the token cost is coming down. If you've I almost included a graph of the token cost over the last eighteen months, and it's almost like an exponential drop off. But your your point is valid. So the OpenAI provider, as well as provide supporting Open AI will support models that are compatible with the Open AI API. So uh, Open Llama is one of those that sort of does that, and there's a, there's a few others. Um, so that's sort of in that that general case. Uh, but we are working on now extra providers for extra services um, and a, a mix of both open source and commercial ones because we sort of know our clients use both. So. Yes, and also I will mention because of the cost, that was part of the reason we built in that rate limiting functionality, just to give you that extra control over it. Thank you. Hello, uh, over here, hi. Hey, hi. the lights are really reflecting off my glasses, yeah. so yeah, make some, well, don't make noise, but wave. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> in your gener in, uh, the image generation, you have in the alt text the description that you put in to generate that image, but I noticed there was a character limit in there. Yep. Is how is it handled if your um, your prompt is longer than that character limit? Yeah, it just uh, truncates it and puts a little ellipse at the end. The other thing, the work that uh, has, I think it's landed in the last week, I've been traveling, so I haven't quite checked it out yet, is part of this work is um, over the years, the um, the recommendations around how long that alt text description should be has changed. So uh, we're actually extending that alt text description. It's currently locked at 125 characters. In the next version of LMS, it'll be 750 characters. And that's just aligning it with the accessibility uh, guideline change over the years. Related to that, I'm not sure if you're aware, a lot of um, AI models, when you put a prompt in like generate me a cloud image, before it passes it to the uh, its image generation engine, it actually passes it through a large language model that gives a really quite descriptive um, description for what the image is going to be. Uh, and that, in a lot of cases, gets returned back to the LMS. And we're gonna, once we've solved and made it longer, we're then gonna automatically use that longer description when it's available, because in our sort of testing, it's a much better description of what's in the image. Great, thank you. And just a quick question, technical one. If I'm uh, adding the AI in my model, so you said that for the text generation, it will be whatever there is a text box, right? So does that mean that my student in my quizzes will have access to the AI generation text in the composition question during an, during an exam? If you want them to, or yes, if you don't want them to, no. Everything in AI in the subsystem is controlled by the capabilities in Moodle. So you can turn it off, turn it on. We are working on in making that sort of easier for teachers to manage, and that's that little research piece that I was talking about because we're working on that now. But because it is capability controlled and the way that the model works, if you don't want it, turn it off. If you do want it, turn it on. And it, it is, and I'm, I'm probably going to turn into a broken record with this, everything that we add to LMS that's AI, you will be able to control. Hi, two quick questions. First question, uh, are you planning to integrate the retrieval augmentation based on the Moodle 5 system? 
So I just made sure I understood that correctly. And uh, about r things like RAG, is that what you're talking about? Yes, RAG based on the Moodle file system for particular course. Are you planning to yes. do this kind of integration? Yes. Yes, yes. So I've already sort of written up a bit of a, a technical spec on RAG and how it may work and some of the things we want to look at from a technical perspective. There's a couple of um, researchy type questions I want to have answered first, but it's, you know, it's, we accounted for it in the subsystem. We just wasn't the first functionality that we rolled out. And another quick question. Actually, uh, Google and AWS are the providers that offer the most flexible infrastructure permitting to integrate almost any uh, large language model. So are, are there plans to integrate these two ecosystems into the providers? So AWS Bedrock, there's a already prototype code on our tracker for that as a provider. Um, because if you're, not, if you're not aware of it, uh, AWS Bedrock runs about 30 plus models, uh, or like a mixture of commercial and open source models. Uh, at the moment, it's probably more than 30 because I haven't looked at it in about a day. Um, yeah, it's no, but legit, it's changing that fast, right? Um, and the cool thing about AWS, if that's part of your ecosystem, is it's deployed basically the models deployed into your own uh, into your own tenancy, so it's not sharing data outside of that tenancy, which is quite cool as well. Thank you. One other one, maybe? Um, you were talking about text generation, image generation. Is it also a plan to, uh, let's say, right now we have a plugin with templates to have a page layout, like with text on the left hand side, image on the right hand side, to say to Moodle, create me a page with text left, image right, and then maybe text beneath, etc. Yeah, so that question's a really good one in, in general is, and it's one of those things that we're, we're seeing in a lot of the, the things that people are sort of asking for and coming out of the initial research is the hard part in that and a lot of things around it is actually not the AI. The AI is probably only about 20% of it. It's actually adding the mechanics and the user interface elements and the workflows to be able to like automate those things in LMS in the first place and making sure we do that and do that well. And actually doing some of those things will actually make the course creation experience better. So we're, we're definitely working on it. But it, it is, I just sort of, I suppose, to answer your question, sort of, yes, we're looking at it. But it is, it is also worth mentioning that AI is like only 20% of that. 